Hello and welcome to Unacademy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. A very good evening and welcome to the third episode of India's biggest foreign policy controversies. Under this series, we have been examining some of the controversial foreign policy decisions taken up by former Indian prime ministers and we are analyzing these issues without any political bias. The topic for today's discussion is Indra and Rajiv Gandhi's costly mistakes in Sri Lanka, which eventually cost India quite dearly and also cost a personal loss for the Gandhi family itself. So this discussion would be very relevant for international relations under GS paper 2 for UPSC civil services examination. So as I was mentioning, these sessions are part of the new limited series that we have launched on India's biggest foreign policy controversies. So do catch these sessions live on these dates at 7 p.m. on our YouTube channel. And if you guys are liking these initiatives, do support us with your likes, your comments, and without fail, subscribe to our channel. So before we begin today's discussion, we have a big announcement. To ensure that our IAS courses are affordable for all the aspirants, we are presenting Unacademy Civil Services Championship Test, UCSE, which shall be conducted on 7th of April. This gives you an opportunity to attempt a UPSC standard question paper and you stand a chance to win up to 90% scholarship on our IAS courses along with several attractive rewards. So if you're interested, please register by using the link provided in the video description and you can even contact us at the number provided over here. So with this, let's get started with today's discussion, which focuses on India's involvement in Sri Lanka's ethnic conflict. The primary focus of today's discussion will be on India's alleged covert support given to Tamil militant organizations, primarily to the LTTE. And to what extent was India involved in aggravating the civil war in Sri Lanka? These controversial decisions were taken up during the Prime Ministership of Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi between 1970s and 1990s. So this shall be the period of our examination. We will analyze this very important yet controversial topic in an unbiased manner and bring out a detailed assessment which could help you in your prelims and as well as in your mains examination. So to understand this topic, first you have to get to the bottom of Sri Lanka's ethnic divide. You need a bit of history and background to understand Sri Lanka's ethnic divisions and what contributed to the ethnic war in Sri Lanka. And then we can discuss what was India's role in this crisis situation and what were the decisions taken up by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and then by her son Rajiv Gandhi. So let's begin by looking at Sri Lanka's demography. Because see in geopolitics, geography of a region plays a very important role in defining the international relations of that particular place. Be it a certain region or any country, the geography of that particular region plays a critical role which includes its physical geography and as well as its human geography. In fact, the study of this is nothing but your geopolitics. Geopolitics essentially is the study of the influence of geographical factors, physical and human geographical factors on the international relations or the international politics of a particular place. So to understand Sri Lanka's ethnic conflict, you have to understand Sri Lanka's human geography, focus on Sri Lanka's demographic profile and understand the ethnic, the ethnic profile of this island nation in the Indian Ocean region. Now please look at the map that has been shared over here. So in Sri Lanka, the majority community happens to be the Sinhalese. All the areas that are shaded in, in purple that you can see here, this is where the Sinhalese ethnic community can be found. And majority of the Sinhalese are Buddhists. Majority of the Sinhalese are followers of Buddhism. So it's the Sinhala Buddhist community which is in majority in Sri Lanka. If you look at the minorities, the most important minority group in Sri Lanka happens to be the Tamil minority. 
and the Tamil minority in Sri Lanka is divided into two distinct groups. You have one set of Tamil minorities called Sri Lankan Tamils. If you observe the map, you can see these maroon shaded areas in the northern and eastern parts of Sri Lanka. The northern province of Sri Lanka is nothing but the Jaffna region and the eastern province is primarily centered around the strategic port of Trincomale. So the Tamil community that you find here in northern and eastern Sri Lanka, in Jaffna and around Trincomale, they are referred to as Sri Lankan Tamils. They are a distinct group of Tamil minorities in Sri Lanka. Because the Sri Lankan Tamils, they have migrated from southern India, that is today's Tamil Nadu, since historical times, since several centuries, the Tamil community from southern parts of uh, India has naturally migrated over a course of time due to trade, cultural and familial relations and they have settled over here since centuries. So the Sri Lankan Tamils represent the older minority community in Sri Lanka. They have lived with the Sinhala Buddhist majority from a very long time and in fact both the communities even had a lo lot of harmony between themselves. The Sri Lankan Tamils were more than welcome by the Sinhala Buddhist majority and their bond and relationship goes back to several centuries. In fact, Buddhism and even Hinduism represent a common religious connection and later even Islam and Christianity form a close religious connection between southern parts of India that is today's Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka. So given the close ethnic, linguistic and religious connections, both the communities here, the Sinhala Buddhist majority and the Sri Lankan Tamil minority, they were living in harmony, they had a, a kind of synergy that had developed between them. Then you have another group of Tamil minority which is the Indian Tamils. The Indian Tamils represent another distinct group of Tamil minorities primarily found in the central parts of Sri Lanka over here. In the map, can you see this yellow colored area, the yellow shaded area? This is where you primarily find the Indian Tamil minority. Indian Tamils, they came to Sri Lanka more recently. During British rule, during the 19th and 20th century, that's when the Indian Tamil community was transported here by the British. As part of the indentured labor system of the British, the British enterprises in uh, Ceylon, as it was called back then, they needed cheap labor to run the plantation crops, which was a very lucrative commercial business for British enterprises in the Sri Lankan highlands or also called the Central Highlands. This region, which has been marked in the map, this is the Central Highlands of Sri Lanka or the Sri Lankan highlands. Its geography, climate, vegetation is very similar to that of India's Western Ghats. As you know, in Western Ghats, particularly in Kerala and Karnataka, Plantation crops and other commercial crops are widely grown from tea, coffee to rubber to spices. They are the primary commercial cash crops. So since colonial times, this potential of Sri Lanka's highlands was being exploited by British enterprises and they needed cheap labor to run these plantations. So under the exploitative indentured labor system through which the British transported Indians around the world. They transported Indian Tamils and settled them in the Sri Lankan highlands to look after the plantations. Now, why am I going into this detail and explaining all this? How is this relevant? That, that's obviously your question. This is extremely important in order to understand the ethnic divisions and the start of Sri Lanka's ethnic conflict. So now that we understood that there were two distinct groups of Tamil minorities, the Sri Lankan and Indian Tamils, right? And the majority was the Sinhala Buddhist community. Now, let us see where the problems began. The initial divisions came up primarily between Sinhala Buddhist majority and the Indian Tamil minority. The Indian Tamils were never accepted by Sinhala Buddhists as their own. 
वेर एज दे हैड ब्लेंडेड विथ द श्रीलंकन तमिल्स हारमनी एग्जिस्टेड बिटवीन श्रीलंकन तमिल्स एंड सिनला बुद्धिस्ट मेजोरिटी बिकॉज श्रीलंकन तमिल्स हैड माइग्रेटेड नेचुरली ओवर अ कोर्स ऑफ टाइम सिंस सेंचुरीज सो दे हैड अ a connection a relationship that existed from centuries but sinhala buddhist majority resisted the entry of indian tamils who were seen as outsiders essentially they held a feeling of resentment against the indian tamil community which was more recently transported to sri lanka by the british and as you know the british deliberately would implement the policy of divide and rule to widen social divisions either on religious lines or caste lines or ethnic lines to enhance their control over these colonies so in india if the british exploited the communal divide between hindus and muslims to drive a wedge in the indian society in sri lanka they exploited the ethnic divisions the british deliberately encouraged indian tamils and openly favored them in their policies they gave very lucrative positions to minority tamils particularly from indian tamil category from the indian tamil community who had come recently to sri lanka who were already seen as outsiders by the sinhala buddhist majority so as indian Ta tamil workers became more influential rich and powerful this was resented by the sinhala buddhist majority so this created a bad blood between the two communities and eventually it led to targeted discrimination against the tamil minorities in sri lanka so when sri lankan tamils sympathized with indian tamils and stood for their cause obviously this radical sinhala buddhist majority would target the entire tamil minority communities including the sri lankan tamils would become a target of the persecution and oppression that would be unleashed after independence so ceylon gained independence in 1948 from british rule and the first sri lankan government which came to power was dominated by the sinhala buddhist majority sri lanka started turning into a majoritarian radical nation and several political parties came up which even advocated radical extremism against the tamil minorities in the country so the primary resentment was against indian tamils but later this became a general resentment against the tamil minority itself so the sri lankan government which by now was under the influence of radical majoritarian ideology would come out with discriminatory policies starting with the citizenship act the sri lankan government enacted the citizenship acts of 1948 and 49 through which indian tamils were rendered stateless essentially they were not recognized as the citizens of sri lanka and sri lanka saw them as outsiders from india Sri Lanka said they are India's responsibility since they have come recently from southern parts of India from the Madras uh, province Sri Lanka insisted that India should take back the Indian Tamil community and this led to targeted persecution and oppression of the Tamil minorities in the country now see how unfair this was Indian Tamils were in Sri Lanka from at least 100 150 years they had contributed to Sri Lanka's economy society and culture but overnight they were being thrown out because of the rise in radical sinhala buddhist ideology and it's very ironic as well because generally we associate buddhism with ahimsa which is the core tenet of of the religion itself but that is the irony with rather any religion right religion by itself does not preach any radicalism or extremism but in almost every faith you find these uh, radicals and extremists who misinterpret their religion for their own sake for their own purposes but in sri lanka more than the communal angle it was the ethnic angle but of course a clear communal division can also be seen because majority of sinhalas are buddhist whereas tamil minorities were hindus christians and muslims so of course a communal angle plays a role but primarily it was the ethnic division which played a bigger role so now sri lanka conveniently placed this burden on india saying that india should take care of indian tamils and it even started repatriating the tamil population so this is where the then nehru government faced an incredible challenge in 1950s one of course india had to look after the tamil minorities given the cultural and familial connection in tamil nadu 
it was very crucial for India to look after the welfare and interests of the Tamil community. We wanted to ensure that the community is safe and protected and there is no targeted violence against them. At the, at the same time, India didn't want to take up any unnecessary burden because of the policies of our neighboring country. So it was a very difficult choice for India and based on this difficult circumstance, the Nehru government and later Lal Bahadur Shastri government as well, they, they took a very balanced decision to accept some of the Indian Tamil refugees who are being repatriated to India while putting diplomatic pressure on Sri Lanka to safeguard and protect the rights of Tamil minorities. India signed a few agreements with Sri Lanka as well. The Shastri Pact, Shastri Sirimavo Bandarnaike Pact, in the, signed in the 1960s. Under this agreement, India agreed to take up joint responsibility of Indian Tamils so that we don't alienate or antagonize the Sri Lankan government. At the same time, we exerted diplomatic pressure as well to ensure that Sri Lanka looks after its minority communities as well. But Sri Lanka did not like this Indian interference. Whatever India was saying, the concerns we were expressing about the Tamil minorities, their well-being, it was interpreted as India's interference in the internal matters of Sri Lanka. So essentially, the targeted discrimination, oppression and even violence continued against Tamil minority community from 1950s all the way till 1970s. Throughout the two decades, despite India's intervention, where we took joint responsibility of Indian Tamils, repatriated some of them and parallelly exerted pressure on Sri Lanka to protect the Tamil minorities. Despite India doing this, there was targeted discrimination and oppression against the Tamil minorities. There were few targeted uh, violent incidents as well, where radical Sinhala Buddhists would commit targeted acts of violence against Tamil minorities. So, as a result, this created a, a deep divide in Sri Lanka society and the Tamil minorities were instigated right now to take up matters into their own hands. The Tamil minority groups in northern and eastern provinces, right? They had to defend themselves against the targeted discrimination and even violence. So some of them started Tamil nationalist movements. They took up the political path to fight for their rights, to fight for equality, to fight for inclusive treatment within Sri Lanka. But some of the radical elements, they, they took up arms against the Sri Lankan state to protect themselves and to defend the Tamil minority community and also to fight back to take revenge on Sri Lanka on the radical Sinhala Buddhists. Some of the extremist um, Tamil separatist leaders, they gave a call for an armed rebellion. It was an outright separatist movement that got triggered by late 1970s. So several Tamil militant organizations were born which would engage in insurgency in the jungles of northern and eastern provinces of Sri Lanka. Their target was the Sri Lankan government, the Sri Lankan forces and obviously radical Sinhala Buddhists. So even Buddhist pilgrimage sites and uh, Sinhala locations would be a target for these Tamil militant organizations. So we saw the rise of Tamil nationalist outfits and separatist insurgent groups and the most notorious amongst them was LTTE, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, founded by V. Prabhakaran. The LTTE would emerge as the most notorious Tamil separatist insurgent organization and its agenda was to liberate these Tamil areas, to liberate northern and eastern province of Sri Lanka and form a separate Tamil nation called a Tamil Elam. Elam in Tamil refers to a state, a nation. So the goal was separatism, to break away the Tamil territories, the northern and eastern provinces and to form a Tamil nation or a Tamil Elam. So this is where differences started emerging between India and Sri Lanka. Now, whatever I am going to discuss is indeed very sensitive and controversial, right? Because the government of India has never acknowledged India's covert involvement in backing the liberation movement. So there will be certain sensitive topics, but as I said, I will ensure that we discuss this in an unbiased manner and we will base this on verifiable, authentic records. We will not take up any conspiracy theories or just uh, go by rumors. 
but we will use solid evidence that's available in the public domain and based on that we'll continue the discussion now when we are discussing this period of india sri lanka relations in 1970s 1980s we should not just look at this from the prism of india sri lanka bilateral relations or we should not just have a narrow approach and focus only on the tamil issue there was something else happening around the region particularly in the indian ocean and also in global geopolitics don't forget this was the cold war era where there was intense rivalry between two superpowers led by the us and the soviet union the western countries the western democracies led by us were involved in a direct geopolitical rivalry and hostility around the world with the eastern bloc countries the communist countries led by the soviet union so this cold war geopolitical rivalry between the superpowers was also playing out during the same time in the indian ocean and india and sri lanka were right in the middle of this cold war so we have to holistically examine all the concerned events and developments and only then we can discuss and assess the decisions of prime minister indira gandhi and later by rajiv gandhi now by 1970s india had major issues with sri lanka our major concern was the mistreatment of tamil minorities which was going on from 1948 right from sri lanka's independence tamil minorities had been discriminated they had been left out and more importantly they had been targeted they had been oppressed and targeted attacks were taking place against them and the state was not stopping or preventing this plus it was becoming a burden for india as india had to take joint responsibility in the interest of maintaining relations with sri lanka we had to take in the indian tamil community and because of the continued oppression and violence refugees tamil refugees also started flowing into india from across the sea route from across park strait and gulf of manar a few tamil refugees would flow down into tamil nadu and india had to take care of them so this was increasing the burden on india and at the same time sri lanka was getting hostile against india sri lanka saw india's concerns as interference when under prime minister nehru and lal bahadur shastri and later indira gandhi when india expressed concern about the way tamil minorities were being treated sri lanka would take offense to it and it alleged that india was interfering in its internal matters so sri lanka had a problem with india taking a stand on the tamil minority issue and parallelly india started facing security challenges from sri lanka as a result of the cold war dynamics Sri Lanka started aligning with United States and especially with Pakistan in 1970s which caused a lot of concern for Prime Minister Indira Gandhi there were genuine security and strategic concerns for India which were not addressed by Sri Lanka so all these events culminated in India launching a covert war in Sri Lanka along with direct involvement in Sri Lanka's ethnic problem on the diplomatic side publicly india was engaging in sri lanka and over the next two decades india would be overtly involved in sri lanka's ethnic conflict and parallelly there was a secret war going on a covert conflict waged by india to destabilize sri lanka so that we could gain leverage over the sri lankan government i know what i'm saying is very controversial as i said the indian government has never fully acknowledged the covert involvement of india in sponsoring or in backing the tamil militant outfit particularly the ltte so you might ask then sir how is this useful for the exam how can we even write this in the exam i'll explain that at the end i'll give you a couple of practice questions and there we can we can discuss how you can approach such sensitive topics without crossing the lines so how are we discussing all these issues then it's all based on verifiable records that today are available right based on uh, investigative journalism based on records of former officers diplomats and intelligence officials who have written sufficiently about these events which has been well acknowledged in the in the in the strategic community right of course the government of india can never acknowledge any such covert involvement so the allegation here against india is that india directly sponsored the ltte it's even alleged that india played a direct and critical role 
in the very creation, formation of LTT and India went to the extent of supplying funds, weapons and even provided military grade training to LTT and few other Tamil militant groups. The allegations also point out that LTT was even provided training bases in India from Tamil Nadu to Uttarakhand. Secret security bases were provided to LTT where Indian agencies were involved in training the militant organization. So let's examine how true these allegations are, what was India's extent of involvement and why did India get involved at all in the first place. See here, there are multiple uh, dimensions that you need to keep in mind. One, India's genuine concern about the Tamil minorities, their well-being, their safety. Second, Sri Lanka's behavior with the Tamil minorities. And third, Sri Lanka's alignment with India's hostile rivals, Pakistan and US, during the Cold War. These three combined together pushed Prime Minister Indira Gandhi to act in India's national interest. There was a clear national interest driven agenda for the Prime Minister to interfere, meddle in Sri Lanka to destabilize the country. The destabilization was driven by the need to gain a leverage on Sri Lankan government so that we could influence Sri Lanka and force Sri Lanka to protect India's interests, which includes the interests of Tamil community and as well as our security and strategic interests, which were being threatened by the United States, Sri Lanka itself, and as well as by Pakistan. So, driven by Cold War calculations, right, that era itself was a very different era where countries would go to any extent to protect their interests. So, India was already party to the Cold War rivalry because during the 1971 war with Pakistan, when India helped in liberation of Bangladesh, we had been threatened by the United States. The then US President Richard Nixon and his national security advisor Henry Kissinger, they held personal hatred against India and in the 1971 war, they firmly aligned with Pakistan, gave direct support to Pakistan, overlooked Pakistan's atrocities against Bengalis in East Pakistan. And they even went to the extent of threatening India with consequences if India went to war and liberated Bangladesh. So during the course of 1971 war, the US had issued a direct threat to India. And this is what placed India in a very difficult situation and it pushed India to abandon the principle of non-alignment. Until then, India was strongly committed to the non-aligned movement. India always believed in an independent, autonomous foreign policy and we had chosen the non-aligned path along with several other countries to ensure we don't choose sides between uh, the Western and Eastern countries. But as US got hostile to India, threatened India, India was forced to abandon non-alignment. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi delivered a diplomatic masterstroke in 1971 during the course of the war by signing the Indo-Soviet Treaty of Peace and Friendship, through which Soviet Union guaranteed support for India, defense assistance for India, if the US were to threaten India. According to several verifiable reports and records, when the American Navy was dispatched to Bay of Bengal to threaten Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, the Soviet Navy was also dispatched to shadow the American naval forces to ensure that India is not brought under threat by the United States. So there was close alignment between India and Soviet Union post-1971 and Soviet naval deployment had increased in the Indian Ocean. And the Americans were trying to counter the increasing Soviet presence and influence. So these global factors connected with Cold War dynamics also had to play, uh, it also had to uh, play a role with regard to the decisions that India would take later. But eventually, it would end up being a costly mistake for India because this path of engaging with extremists or using extremism for geopolitical reasons would often backfire, right? India learned this lesson the hard way. That was not the intention of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi when we went into this uh, covert conflict, but very quickly things got out of hand. And in most cases, that is what happens when you get involved with extremist actors. Any country which has been involved in sponsoring extremist organizations in order to use them for geopolitical uh, reasons, they've all suffered the same fate. 
be it Pakistan or be it United States or be it other major powers in West Asia and around the world. They've all tried using extremist non-state actors for geopolitical reasons. But in most cases, they lose control over them. They go out of hand. And that is when the strategy will backfire. So India would pay heavily in the coming days for this involvement of India. So let's understand this in slight detail. Let's go slightly into the topic and understand what pushed Prime Minister Indira Gandhi to start this policy against Sri Lanka. What was the justification? Was it really a mistake or a blunder? And what went wrong? And then we'll discuss how Rajiv Gandhi picked it up and, and how Rajiv Gandhi dealt with the issue and what were the consequences. See, even though we had some problems with Sri Lanka, it's not that it was an entirely prob problematic relationship. Any relationship is complex. There were areas of cooperation and friendship as well. But there were areas of concern. So Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in 1970s, on one hand was dealing with the security and strategic concerns created by the Sri Lankan government and its hostile approach. But parallelly, India was constantly trying to build a friendly relationship as well. Of course, there were problems in the relationship. The challenges created by Sri Lanka was affecting India. But the relationship was not entirely broken down. So first, let's examine what were the problems we were facing. During the 1971 war, there was something that Sri Lanka did which instigated Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Indira Gandhi's administration, the government, the strategic establishment, which includes our armed forces, intelligence agencies, our foreign policy establishment, they were all triggered by what Sri Lanka did during the 1971 war. When the war was taking place, Pakistan was an enemy state and India had closed its airspace so that West Pakistan could not send any reinforcements to East Pakistan. In 1971, the war had broken out on all the fronts, both on Western and Eastern front. An active conflict was taking place where India was overtly fighting Pakistan to help liberate Bangladesh. Prior to that, India had covertly supported the Bengali rebellion movement, Mukti Bahini, where India's intelligence agency, Research and Analysis Wing, or RAW, was authorized by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi as early as 1968-69 to develop close connections with Bengali leaders. So India had a covert and overt involvement in East Pakistan and played a decisive role in assisting in the liberation of Bangladesh. Right? So India not only uh, won the war and liberated Bangladesh, but we had broken Pakistan into two parts. So during this crucial war, right, which was one of India's finest diplomatic, military and intelligence uh, moments, India expected other countries in the region to remain neutral. India did have concerns about Sri Lanka, right, and India knew that if Pakistan had to send any reinforcements to East Pakistan, towards the Eastern Theatre, it can happen only through Indian Ocean, right? So Pakistan would need logistical support in between. Pakistani Air Force and even Pakistani Navy, if they had to move around the Indian subcontinent and reach East Pakistan to send uh, reinforcements and resupplies, they will need logistical support somewhere in between, like a pit stop. And Sri Lanka was the only viable option. Sri Lanka-Pakistan always had decent relations. And during the war, Sri Lanka went against India. Sri Lanka gave logistical support to Pakistan. It allowed Pakistani aircraft and vessels to refuel and dock at Sri Lankan ports and airports. And this was something which instigated Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. This was a hostile act because during the course of war, an enemy state had been assisted by a friendly neighboring country. This was the first trigger for India. The logistical support and even the open political diplomatic support Sri Lanka had given to Pakistan during the war is what acted as the first trigger for India. Next, after this, in the mid-70s, Sri Lanka would align with not just Pakistan, but even with United States. Now, again, you might ask, sir, what's the basis of your argument? On what basis are you quoting uh, these, these stories and theories? Let me back this up with 
one of the most reputed uh, books in in this domain which has been written by b raman b raman was a former indian intelligence officer from the ips cadre who had worked as a career intelligence officer with india's external intelligence agency raw or research and analysis wing he retired in early 90s as a as one of the secretaries uh, he headed the counter terrorism division at raw uh, prior to his retirement and later he went on to write a very popular book the cowboys of raw which you can see over here this book was a tribute to rn cow ramnath cow the founding director of raw which was established in the year 1968 by prime minister indira gandhi until then india's external and domestic intelligence both were handled by ib or intelligence bureau but the incapacity of ib had been proven during the two wars in 1960s because you can't have one agency dealing with both foreign intelligence and domestic intelligence both are different specialized roles so following the 1962 war with china and 1965 war with pakistan the need was felt to set up a dedicated foreign intelligence agency so in 1968 indira gandhi had established raw and rn cow was chosen to head this new organization so raw would look after india's external intelligence while ib would focus only on india's domestic intelligence so rn cow who raised the organization and registered tremendous success in india's neighborhood and beyond he is largely credited with building and shaping india's foreign intelligence agency so b raman himself was one of the cow boys the initial batch of officers who were groomed by rn cow they were popularly referred to as cow boys and b raman himself was one amongst them right they idealized idealized rn cow and post retirement he wrote a book that details some of india's intelligence operations in the neighborhood and beyond and the book was a tribute to rn cow so in this book b raman provides certain details which indeed has been verified and and authenticated by many other diplomats intelligence officers and and former officials so i actually present a direct a uh, screenshot from this book itself cowboys of raw where b raman says that pakistani air force was allowed to refuel in sri lanka which instigated prime minister indira gandhi india carried out an assessment and saw this as a hostile action by sri lanka during the war but interestingly at the same time india was helping sri lanka as well in mid 1970s sri lanka was facing a major security problem because of radical marxist extremists in sri lanka there was a extremist communist party called the jvp janta vimukti peramuna it was a ultra left wing extremist marxist organization and what's interesting was it was being supported by china and north korea these extremist communist powers which were looking to spread extremist communism they were backing this extremist group in sri lanka called jvp which was a threat to sri lankan government at that point it was india which assisted sri lanka even though sri lanka had been hostile to us on one side india was trying to help sri lanka as well to ensure that we can still retain sri lanka as a friend of india so indira gandhi provide assistance to sri lanka to to wipe out the jvp which posed a threat to sri lanka and even to india because this left wing extremist communist group had built connections with naxals in india posing a security threat for india as well so india's raw was involved in tackling the jvp threat in sri lanka and that is how indira gandhi helped sri lanka as well even when sri lanka had created a problem for india that's why i told you earlier it's a very uh, complex relationship that we had it was a policy of contradictions uh, during the indira gandhi period on one hand we were having issues we were getting triggered but we were trying to repair the relationship trying to do our best to build a friendly partnership as well so indira gandhi helped sri lanka to neutralize the jvp threat the uh, communist threat right and we even worked out the maritime boundary line between india and sri lanka india sri lanka maritime boundary agreements were signed between 1974 and 1976 where indira gandhi ceded kachathivu to sri lanka in 1974 india agreed to cede kachathivu to sri lanka 
and this was a strategic decision by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. I know you might be hearing a lot about Kacha Tivu in the last two, three days because Prime Minister Modi himself, Foreign Minister Jai Shankar himself have publicly criticized the Congress government, the Congress Prime Ministers and even Prime Minister Indira Gandhi for gifting away, throwing away Kacha Tivu. Please understand, during elections, this could just be a part of election rhetoric. Because a careful examination of Kachatiwu issue shows that it was not out of negligence or carelessness that India gave away Kachatiwu. India did cede. We did give away claims on Kachatiwu. But it was a strategic choice, a well thought out decision. And again, it's not my personal opinion. This is the opinion of several former diplomats who have criticized the statements of the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister. Because despite knowing the context in which India ceded Kachatiwu, Still, the issue is being politicized primarily due to electoral gains. So, the Kachatiwu issue, which had persisted from a long time, right? Kachatiwu is this small barren island located over here, a small dot, a speck located between India and Sri Lanka, right? You can see all the important areas here, the Gulf of Manar and Park Bay. So, Kachatiwu has held a lot of significance for fishermen community on both the sides, be it Tamil Nadu fishermen or fishermen from Jaffna, the Tamil fishermen and even Sinhala fishermen from Jaffna, for them Kachatiwu has been very important historically and even for fishermen from India's Tamil Nadu and Rameshwaram region, Kachatiwu has been very important. It was formed by a volcanic eruption in the 14th century, right? And since then, Jaffna kingdom had control over it for some time. Later, it came under the Ramnad Zamindari in Tamil Nadu, right? And since then, it passed on to colonial control, first the Dutch and then the British. So for a large part of time, it has remained as part of India, as part of British India, as part of the Ramnath Kingdom or the Ramnath Zamindari. So India had the right historical claims over Kachatiwu. There's no doubt about it. India did give away the claim. We did cede the territory. But why was it done? It was done for a particular reason. Because for Sri Lanka, Kachatiwu was seen as vital. Right? Given, given that fishermen use Kachatiwu to rest, to dry their nets, plus to visit the St. Anthony's Church, which is a very important pilgrimage for fishermen uh, communities on both the sides. Right? Keeping in mind Sri Lanka's interest, India agreed to cede Kachatiwu and this was not a negligent choice or a careless choice to compromise India's sovereignty. Because in return, India gained something else. This paved the way for the 1976 Maritime Agreement. It allowed for the settlement of the maritime boundary issue which was pending from 1947-48. And more importantly, India got access to another important island and region, the Vodge Bank, which is blessed with resources. It was a trade-off. It's not what you're hearing. It's not India gifting away Kachatiwu. Yes, we did cede our claims on Kachatiwu, but in return, we got something else. One was control over Vodge Bank, a critical region in the Park Bay Gulf of Manar Strait. Right, which is blessed with resources and India got this under its sovereignty. This wouldn't have happened if not for India ceding claims on Kachatiw. It was a give and take. Diplomacy is always about reciprocity or rather any relationship for that matter is about reciprocity. You give something and you get something in return. So trading Kachatiw with Watch Bank was a strategic choice made by India. It also facilitated the smoother settlement of the maritime boundary line, international maritime boundary line was drawn, clearly establishing the boundaries between India and Sri Lanka. And the intention was to keep Sri Lanka in India's influence, under India's influence, to ensure Sri Lanka doesn't slip away from India's influence and align with Pakistan or US and other strategic threats. Is that clear? You have to keep in mind the global context, the Cold War dynamics. It was in that context that Kachatiwu was ceded by India, right? So there was something we were giving away. Yes, that's correct. That's true. But it's incorrect to say that it was a negligent decision. It was a strategic choice made by India, keeping in mind the other gains that India would accrue, right? So 
the reason why I'm elaborating this is because you'll get an idea that India-Sri Lanka relations was not just about the Tamil problem. That was one issue. And Sri Lanka siding with Pakistan, Sri Lanka's hostile approach to India, yes, it was creating problems. At the same time, in the 1970s, Indira Gandhi made an attempt to repair the relationship, to show a, a hand of friendship as well, to defeat the communist extremist movement. Right? India assisted Sri Lanka. We played a role in satisfying Sri Lanka's demands by ceding Kachati and getting other benefits in return. But apart from that, Sri Lanka continued its hostile approach with India. See, that is the diplomatic challenge always when you're dealing with uh, problematic countries and governments. This will always remain a challenge. In the 1970s, Sri Lanka tried siding with the US. It was getting closer to the US which would pose a direct threat to Indian interests and as well as to Soviet interests in the Indian Ocean. Now, please look at this map here. Can you see this island called Diego Garcia? It's a British Indian Ocean territory. That's part of the Chagos group of islands, which should actually belong to Mauritius. But the British never gave up the Chagos group of islands. They never decolonized it. They held on to some islands here in the Chagos group for strategic reasons. And after Second World War, they transferred this to the United States. And today the US has built one of the largest military bases at Diego Garcia. And it's from here that Richard Nixon ordered the 7th Fleet of US Navy, which is a carrier battle group to be deployed into Bay of Bengal to threaten India during the 1971 war. As US was backing Pakistan during the war, Nixon and Kissinger right, who had become hostile to India, right, according to several verifiable reports, they ordered the deployment of the US 7th Naval Fleet, which consists of an entire carrier, carrier battle group, including an aircraft carrier, uh, missile destroyers and nuclear powered submarines and nuclear equipped uh, ships and submarines. So they were dispatched to Bay of Bengal to threaten India and Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. That is when India made a big decision to abandon non-alignment and signed a historic treaty with the Soviets who came to India's support and assistance. So essentially, a bigger game, a great game was going on in the Indian Ocean between US and Soviet Union. So at this point, it was crucial for India to protect itself and also to protect the interests of Soviet Union. So the Americans were trying to get closer to Sri Lanka and according to reports, the US wanted to set up a radio station at Colombo, a very controversial radio station. And there were few American investments in Sri Lanka, which was seen as a threat by India. Now, this is very well documented by B. Raman in his book, The Cowboys of Raw. He states that India's raw picked up intelligence in Sri Lanka and in Singapore, that a Singapore based company a Singapore-based company was planning to invest in petroleum depots in Sri Lanka at Trincomalee. See, Trincomalee port is known for its petroleum uh, storage facilities. During World War itself, the British had created few petroleum storage facilities. Later, India had helped in the reconstruction of these petroleum depots. It was crucial for energy security of the region. But the US was trying to play a role discreetly. Apart from having a major naval base in the region, which had been used to threaten India, there was a second concern uh, raised for India, where this Singapore-based investment company was seeking to set up petroleum storage tanks and get involved in Sri Lanka's energy and petroleum sector. Raw's assessment was that this was a front for US intelligence agencies. Raw believed it was not a genuine investment firm or an organization. Rather, it was just a front organization acting on behalf of American intelligence, the CIA or the National Security Agency. So this was one concern. Sri Lanka was about to allow this investment to happen from a Singapore based firm, which was most likely acting as a as a front for American intelligence agencies. And parallelly, the US was looking to set up a radio station Voice of America. You might have heard about it. It's a very popular radio network even today. But back in the Cold War era, it was widely believed in the strategic and intelligence community that Voice of America was just a front for American intelligence operations. Meaning, 
uh, in front in the front or in the public domain it would be a genuine commercial radio station acting like a media network but behind the scenes the communication infrastructure would be used for technical intelligence collection to intercept communication of the enemies so it was believed that the state department the us state department and cia were funding voice of america and it came up with a proposal to set up the radio station at colombo now india strongly opposed this because the fear was the american intelligence agencies would use the radio communication network to intercept our communication to focus on india's naval facilities in southern india to intercept indo soviet communication happening in the indian ocean so this decision by sri lanka to allow the establishment of the radio station was seen as a threat by indira gandhi's government so these were the triggers that pushed indira gandhi to get directly involved in sri lanka's ethnic conflict on one hand we were genuinely concerned about the tamil minorities we were concerned about their safety their well being but parallelly what sri lanka did with regard to backing pakistan during the war aligning with us and trying to give us a role in the indian ocean this was a threat for indian interests and soviet interests which had stood with india so it was crucial for india to gain leverage over the sri lankan government to hit back at sri lanka in a indirect manner so this is what probably pushed prime minister indira gandhi to take this controversial and disastrous call to wage a secret war a covert war against sri lanka and the goal was only to get leverage on sri lanka to use this issue to back the tamil militant groups which are taking shape so that we will have influence of the sri lankan government and thus we can protect the tamils we could even protect india's security and strategic interests but unfortunately this plan this strategy completely failed for india it would backfire for india there would be devastating consequences for india throughout the 80s and 90s and that is what we will discuss in the last part of the session so in 1983 indira gandhi had come back for the second term the emergency period was gone all the negative uh, publicity associated with the emergency and the destruction of indian democracy had been erased and now indira gandhi had come back for the second term she was still a very popular leader in 1983 there were large scale anti tamil riots particularly in colombo and also in the northern and eastern provinces because by now ltt which had risen to influence which was raising funds and weapons from tamil diaspora and and other sources as well was becoming a notorious militant group it was carrying out major attacks against sri lanka so as a result radical sinhala buddhists with the backing of sri lankan state they retaliated against innocent tamil civilians causing a massive atrocity in the country these targeted anti tamil riots triggered a humanitarian crisis in sri lanka triggering a massive refugee crisis into india this was the final nail in the coffin for indira gandhi thousands of tamil refugees started flowing into tamil nadu india had to deal with the burden so now a call was made a decision was made that india's raw will directly get involved india will play a direct role we will back the tamil militant groups provide funds weapons and any other support logistical support needed including training that to in indian bases is that clear so india went to great extent to back the militant movement led by ltte again it's not just a conspiracy theory or a personal opinion of mine it's again based on verifiable records B Raman writes in Cowboys of Raw that Indira Gandhi was extremely unhappy about the insensitivity of Sri Lanka towards the Tamil community and as well as towards Indian interests even after India had done so much for Sri Lanka so now time had come to teach Sri Lanka a lesson but this strategy of India would go out of hand and that is what happens when you sponsor any kind of extremism these extremist outfits they easily go out of control you can't control them and usually these strategies backfire right that's what every country has learnt as well but still many countries continue with this covert option of using extremist groups for geopolitical purposes so india would provide training to some of the radical uh, tamil youth who were ready to take up militancy and 
in Tamil Nadu and as well as in Uttarakhand, Indian security camps were used by RAW to provide training in jungle warfare. We would supply weapons and also allow LTTE to raise funds, weapons from other sources, private sources as well. Because LTTE had very good connections with the Tamil diaspora community, which is spread out across Southeast Asia and Europe and uh, across North America. Be it in Canada, be it in US, in uh, UK, in Singapore, Malaysia, in Australia. In all these countries, Tamil diaspora was very strong. They all sympathized with uh, the Tamil community. And especially in the Indian state of Tamil Nadu, there was a wave of sympathy in favor of the Tamil community in Sri Lanka. So as a result, LTTE became a well-funded organization. Apart from the state support from India, there was widespread support from around the world and it started building connections with arms traffickers, drugs traffickers and other terrorist groups as well. So very quickly, LTT became a notorious group, a dangerous outfit and it started scaling up the violence in Sri Lanka. So this period was brutal in Sri Lanka from 1984 to 87. So as LTT became stronger and powerful, it stepped up its attacks and Sri Lankan forces retaliated. Eventually, it was Tamil civilians who were suffering and this crisis engulfed the country, triggering a massive refugee crisis into Tamil Nadu and Kerala. So eventually, it was India which got burned. It was India which got affected as the violence escalated and Sri Lanka got destabilized. India's intention was never to back Tamil Elam or to support the creation of a Tamil nation. Our intention was only to gain leverage, only to use that as a, a pressure tactic on Sri Lanka. But things were going out of hand very quickly. And more importantly, India had suffered a massive loss when Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was assassinated. Indira Gandhi's assassination was a result of the Khalistan movement. Her own bodyguards who had been radicalized by Khalistan ideology assassinated the Prime Minister causing a major setback for India. So these were the difficult times that India was going through. That is when Indira Gandhi's son, Rajiv Gandhi, took over as the Prime Minister. By then, Tamil nationalist and separatist sentiments had shockingly spread to the Indian state of Tamil Nadu as well. Now Indian intelligence agencies were getting worried and concerned IB and RAW were alarmed that Tamil nationalist and separatist sentiments championed by LTTE had spread to Tamil Nadu as well and few elements, a few radical elements in Tamil Nadu were trying to widen the scope of the movement. Now they were saying that a Tamil Elam, a so-called Tamil Elam, if they managed to liberate those areas, would not only include the northern and eastern provinces of Sri Lanka, but it could include Tamil Nadu of India as well. So that is how our strategy had backfired. The large sympathy and support generated in Tamil Nadu, right, and the base that LTT had got in Tamil Nadu. There were local politicians and other entities involved in backing the LTT, sympathizing with LTT, which is understandable as well. But it went to an extent where few radical elements came up in Tamil Nadu as well, who, who were championing the idea of a Tamil nationalist separatist movement to create a separate Tamil nation by breaking away the Tamil areas, not just in Sri Lanka, but also in India. So now things were getting really out of hand and something had to be done to curb and while, uh, wipe out this movement. So Rajiv Gandhi decided that LTT has to go. LTT has to end this war and India started mediating between the LTT and the Sri Lankan government. Bhutan was used as a third neutral country for these negotiations. India was very close to Bhutan, right? We all, even today, we are very, very close to Bhutan. We convinced Bhutan to host these meetings between Indian leaders and officials, LTT leaders and Sri Lankan leaders and officials. Following these negotiations, a historic peace accord was worked out by India. It was the personal initiative of Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. He wanted the conflict to end through talks, through negotiations, through peaceful methods. The idea was not to escalate the war. India started scaling down its support to LTT as well. 
and we wanted to convince both the parties to settle the conflict, end this violence through talks and negotiations and work out a mediated settlement. This led to the signing of the historic India-Sri Lanka Peace Accord of 1987. Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi and the then Sri Lankan leader signed this historic accord. Let me tell you what were the provisions. The first main provision was an immediate ceasefire, immediate end to the war and Sri Lankan forces will be returned to the barracks. The Sri Lankan government agreed to withdraw the troops to end its counterinsurgency, counterterrorist operations and withdraw, withdraw the troops to the barracks. And parallelly, LTT committed to surrender. So, obviously, the return of Sri Lankan troops to the barracks was conditional on LTT surrender. LTT will have to lay down its arms and weapons, surrender to the Sri Lankan authorities and in return, Sri Lanka would pull back the troops and end the war, calling for a ceasefire. And India made Sri Lanka promise that the militants will not be targeted. They will not be, they will not be abused. India convinced Sri Lanka to provide for protection of Tamil rights through a constitutional amendment to ensure that Tamil concerns are taken care of. So India committed Sri Lanka, India basically pushed Sri Lanka to commit to this constitutional amendment which is popularly called the 13th amendment. It is a very important topic even today. Because even today, Sri Lanka has not fully implemented the 13th Amendment. Even now, whenever Indian leaders interact with Sri Lankan leaders, we remind Sri Lanka of the failed promise. Because 13th Amendment has not been fully implemented by Sri Lanka. So, under 13th Amendment, India's goal was to get equal recognition for Tamil language. Because believe it or not, until then, Sri Lanka had only treated Sinhalese language as, as a superior language. Tamil language was not seen as a national language. It was not given the status of a national language. It had to be pushed by India. And more importantly, it included devolution of powers. India convinced Sri Lanka that autonomous councils will be set up in the northern and eastern provinces. Autonomous councils will be set up and powers will be delegated. For example, India also has few autonomous councils in the northeast under 6th schedule where many subjects are devolved, delegated to the provincial councils or autonomous uh, district councils. On similar lines, Sri Lanka also agreed that the Tamil inhabited areas of northern and eastern provinces, they would become autonomous councils, right? they would become autonomous territories or provinces and autonomous councils would be, would be set up to look after the administration. All key subjects would be devolved, delegated and separate elections will be held so that Tamil parties could contest and administer the region through these councils and look after the administration of these areas. So, Sri Lanka did implement the 13th Amendment eventually, but it is only a partial implementation. It, give, it did give recognition to the Tamil language. It put it on par with Sinhalese language. It provided for partial devolution. It established the autonomous councils and many years later, some elections were held as well. But however, key subjects have not been transferred. Key subjects like land, police, law and order and even few financial powers, they have not been delegated by the central government in Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankan government has retained these key subjects and only other minor subjects like education, uh, rural development, agriculture, water management, such subjects have been devolved. But the key subjects of land, police, law and order, finance and others, they have been held back. So that's why we say that 13th Amendment has not been fully implemented. It's only a partial implementation. All right. But that is not the prime reason why the peace accord is seen as a failure or a partial success. There was something else that happened. Rajiv Gandhi said, India will deploy troops to ensure that the ceasefire is maintained. Indian peacekeeping forces were drawn out from the Indian Army and few other paramilitary forces and they were deployed on a peacekeeping mission. Please make a note of this. It was not a combat role. They were not being sent to fight a war. They were not being sent to target LTT or wipe out LTT. It was a non-combat role to maintain peace, to ensure LTT surrenders, 
to ensure LTTE does not resort to attacks again and to maintain the ceasefire between the Sri Lankan forces and the LTTE. These were the terms of the agreement and it appeared that India had finally played a positive role. But after the accord was signed, both LTTE and Sri Lanka betrayed India and Rajiv Gandhi. Sri Lanka at this point hated India basically, held India responsible for all the problems as it always believed LTT was India's creation. It was conveniently ignoring the decades of oppression, discrimination and violence it had carried out against the Tamils. It put the entire blame on India, resented India for forcing it to negotiate with LTT. And right now LTT also had turned against India. V. Prabhakaran was angry and upset that India never truly supported the Tamil Elam cause. That India was only playing geopolitics by supporting the Tamil movement. So now, LTT wanted revenge against India. Sri Lanka also wanted the same against India. So what happened later was an absolute disaster for India. According to several reports, the Sri Lankan forces and intelligence agencies which were aware of the positions of Indian uh, troops, the IPKF troops, they revealed the location to the LTTE, so LTTE could attack the Indian troops. The Indian forces were not adequately prepared for this deployment. There was complete lack of coordination between RAW, the Indian Army and other concerned stakeholders. Because not everyone was on board the peace accord. RAW wanted to continue its engagement with LTTE, at least maintain the connections. Indian Army was ill-equipped. It wasn't aware of the ground realities when it was deployed. It even lacked basic uh, maps and intelligence when it was deployed into Sri Lanka. So this happens to be one of the critical failures of Rajiv Gandhi. A good intention de uh, decision was taken. The intention was good. But there wasn't enough thought behind it. There wasn't enough coordination between different arms of the Indian government. Different agencies and different entities were working at cross purposes. So when Indian troops were deployed, they were basically being sent blind into Sri Lanka. And now LTT started targeting them. They were sitting ducks, Indian troops were sitting ducks for the LTT. Indian troops would later engage in combat as well. It became a combat mission from a peacekeeping uh, mission, right? And India would target LTT leading to brutal conflict between the Indian army and, and the LTT. So there was an involvement of Sri Lanka here in betraying India as well. So the peace accord was largely a failure. Apart from few minor changes like the status given to Tamil language and a partial uh, 13th amendment. Apart from that, the peace accord was largely a failure, a setback for India. And eventually the LTTE ended up slaughtering 900 plus Indian soldiers. Almost 900 to 1000 Indian soldiers of the Indian peacekeeping forces lost their lives in this deadly conflict because by now LTT had become a brutal terrorist organization. It was no longer a militant or an insurgent group. It was an out and out terrorist outfit by 1987-88. It had built deadly connections from Palestinian outfits like PLO to later Taliban and Al-Qaeda the Naxals with arms traffickers and drug smuggling cartels. It had built connections around the world from Africa to Europe to West Asia to Southeast Asia. It became a, a very notorious and even a popular group which could easily raise funds as it had now pushed back the Indian troops. Eventually, the Indian involvement became so unpopular right, that IPKF had to be withdrawn. India had to eventually withdraw the IPKF and it was a loss for India. It was quite humiliating as well because the mighty Indian forces had been pushed out by an insurgent terrorist organization. So this was a massive setback and these were the costly mistakes that India would end up making in Sri Lanka. Then finally, Rajiv Gandhi himself would personally pay the price for some of these decisions. That is what is unfortunate about the world of geopolitics and, and covert wars. 
Rajiv Gandhi by then had stepped down by 1989. His popularity had gone down. There was a Beaufort's corruption scandal which had hit as well. Right? Plus the scandal in Sri Lanka, the, the devastation IPK have suffered in Sri Lanka. So Rajiv Gandhi had stepped down. There were two coalition governments in between. Very weak and uh, minor coalition governments for a couple of years. In 1991, fresh elections were called. By then, Rajiv Gandhi had built his popularity back. Following the disastrous regime of the two coalition governments, the Congress party had once again become popular. Rajiv Gandhi had regained his popularity and it was widely expected that Rajiv Gandhi is going to win the elections. It was widely anticipated that Indian National Congress is going to get a majority with Rajiv Gandhi becoming the Prime Minister of India. So during the election campaign, the Congress had released its party manifesto. In the manifesto, the Congress promised, that is Rajiv Gandhi essentially promised, that if the party is elected and if Rajiv Gandhi becomes the PM again, he promised to wipe out LTTE by helping the Sri Lankan government. The manifesto committed that Rajiv Gandhi would take, essentially retaliate or avenge the killing of IPKF soldiers by LTTE. India promised to assist Sri Lanka, provide intelligence support, weapons support as well to decimate the LTT and neutralize the terrorist outfit. So this statement, which Rajiv Gandhi kept promising during the campaign as well, obviously made him the target. V. Prabhakaran saw any such election of Rajiv Gandhi as a direct threat. Every opinion poll indicated that Congress is likely to get majority as well and most likely Rajiv Gandhi would be the next PN. So this caused panic within LTT's leadership, particularly for V. Prabhakaran and the notorious plot to assassinate India's former Prime Minister was started. After a few failed attempts, eventually LTT suicide bombers, they got to Rajiv Gandhi at Sri Perambadur on the outskirts of Chennai when Rajiv Gandhi was going to attend an election rally. So during this incident, the suicide uh, bomber exploded the suicide vest, detonated the suicide vest, killing Rajiv Gandhi who was in close proximity and it led to the assassination of a former Indian Prime Minister. See, this is not about uh, just the individual or the party they belong to, the ideology they belong to. It's about Indian Prime Minister, former Indian Prime Minister being assassinated by a terrorist organization. Right? So this was indeed a huge security failure and intelligence lapse on India's part and it was also an outcome of all the disastrous decisions that had been taken. Even though the intentions were right to protect Indian interests, the involvement in sponsoring extremist forces had backfired on India and India paid a big price, a heavy price, where our national interests were affected, our ties with Sri Lanka was affected for a long time. LTT after this, it continued to be a threat. It became even more notorious because in India there was a huge backlash after Rajiv Gandhi's assassination. There was a lot of pressure on subsequent Indian governments to not get involved in Sri Lanka. Right? Following from Narasimha Rao to, to Vajpayee to Manmohan Singh, there was a lot of pressure on Indian governments to not back a uh, Sri Lankan government or not get involved in Sri Lanka in any way. Right? Even though India wanted to wipe out LTT by assisting the Sri Lankan government, there was a lot of negative public uh, pressure on the Indian government to not play a role in Sri Lanka anymore. Right? And whenever India tried to help Sri Lankan government later, there would be a lot of backlash in Tamil Nadu. So this would become a very challenging uh, foreign policy issue for India for the next couple of decades until the LTT was wiped out in 2009. After Mahinda Rajapaksa became the Prime Minister in 2005, he launched the last phase of the civil war. And again, India could not directly help the Sri Lankan government because of the pressure from Tamil Nadu. Eventually, China would step in. China would provide the required armed support, right? And even provide diplomatic support when Sri Lanka was accused of human rights violations at UN Human Rights Council. And this undermined Indian influence and led to the rise of Chinese influence post-2005. Especially by 2009-2010, when LTT was decimated, V. Prabhakaran was... Uh, assassinated as well by Sri Lankan forces by 2009. Following that, Sri Lanka got very close to China because China had given all the support needed during the war and also 
global diplomatic support at UN and UN Human Rights uh, Council. So Chinese influence increased, which undermined Indian interests. And these were some important lessons that India learned from this uh, episode in Sri Lanka. So it was a difficult, challenging period from 70s to 90s. But some of the controversial decisions indeed led to a big price being paid by the country and also personally by both the Prime Ministers. So on this note, I would like to end this session. But please take up a practice question. A prelims question. India-Sri Lanka Peace Accord of 1987 was an outcome of ethnic war in Sri Lanka. Constitutional devolution to Tamil areas was part of Sri Lanka's commitment under the accord. India deployed IPKF under the accord to target and neutralize the LTTE. Which of the following statements are correct? I'll not give you the answer. I've given you the explanation already. So let me know the answer in the comment section. Coming to the mains practice questions. This is where I would like to tell you how you can approach and handle these sensitive topics if there is a mains question. Let's say, examine the immediate causes that contributed to the ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka is given as a question by UPSC. It's not directly referring to India's involvement or India's alleged sponsorship. Of course, in the exam, you can't openly state that India was involved in sponsoring LTT. That would be extremely incorrect. So this is where you have to be a little diplomatic. So when you're evaluating the immediate causes, which begins with the discrimination against Tamil community, the Citizenship Act, how Sri Lanka oppressed the Tamil minorities, right? You mention all those reasons.